It really is difficult for me to see President Moon as a mediator. The matchmaker is probably the wrong word. He said that the U.S. and North Korea should talk. The United States doesn't want to launch those negotiations in a serious way. And President Moon told President Trump that he's sending an envoy to North Korea. Sending an envoy is a, is a good step. Waiting for the right conditions uh, is, is the right way to go. If talks get going, uh, we need someone credible, and I'm not sure who that person is right now. It exists to achieve political objectives, denuclearization the Korean Peninsula, and peace. The military can provide him all the options uh, that uh, are necessary. From the Voice of America, this is Washington Talk. Hello and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. The Winter Olympics was an opportunity for the U.S. and North Korea to express willingness to hold exploratory talks. South Korean President Moon Jae-in was behind this, trying to mediate talks between Washington and Pyongyang. Anything that would be discussed would have to be solely on the focus of them agreeing to denuclearize the peninsula. Now my guest today, Mr. Frank Januzzi, president of the Mansfield Foundation and former advisor to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Also joining me today, Mr. David Maxwell, fellow at the Institute for Korean American Studies. Mr. Maxwell is a retired U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel with command assignments in Korea, among other countries. Welcome to both of you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. David, let me begin with you. Uh, President Moon, during the Olympics, urged the dignitaries from the United States and North Korea to hold talks. Before the Olympics, he vowed to take the driver's seat. Now he claims to be a matchmaker. So has it been a successful matchmaker between Washington and Pyongyang? Well, that's a great question. I think that uh, you know we have to remember that the administration's policy is maximum pressure and engagement. So I think the U.S. is willing to engage. Uh, I think President Moon's near-term objective for the Olympics was to get through the Olympics without an incident. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, and of course he said that the U.S. and, and North Korea should talk. Uh, but as a matchmaker, I find that a difficult uh, concept. Uh, the United States and South Korea are blood allies. You know, North Korea is an ex existential threat to the Republic of Korea. It really is difficult for me to see uh, President Moon as a mediator between its, its deadly threat and its blood ally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I find that difficult, although I think I understand what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should all agree that uh, uh, if we can bring uh, all sides together, as we've tried to do many times in the past, mm -hmm. uh, it can reduce tensions. Mm -hmm. But I find his position uh, difficult and, and troubling. Mm -hmm. Frank? Well, I think uh, David's right. The matchmaker is probably the wrong word. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, without some kind of mediation or at least offering of good offices, uh, the United States and North Korea have had a real tough time um, finding a path back toward dialogue. And while the U.S. has said that they're, they're willing to engage with the North, uh, really they've also set a, an important precondition. Uh, as uh, a spokeswoman uh, Sarah Sanders pointed out, the United States doesn't want to launch those negotiations in a serious way until the North first agrees that denuclearization will be the end goal. Um, I think it's a reasonable request on the part of the United States, but it has proven to, to, to establish a very high bar uh, that has been an obstacle to getting the talk started. Mm -hmm. In his latest efforts, uh, President Moon told President Trump that he's sending an envoy to North Korea. How will this trip uh, lay the groundwork for future North-South or North-U.S. talks? Well, I think, that, uh, I think it's important uh, that he did not accept the invitation uh, from Kim Jong-un. Uh, I think Kim Jong-un probably expected that he would, uh, although in the past, uh, past summits have begun with an envoy, uh, as, as this one uh, may, may do. So I think that uh, sending an envoy is a, is a good step, uh, but I think that uh, President Moon's position of not 
you know, of also waiting for the right conditions uh, is, is the right way to go. Uh, so we will see what happens uh, you know, if the North will accept an envoy uh, and then what kind of coordination uh, will be made. But it's key for South Korea and the United States to continue close coordination and dialogue. Mm -hmm. Summit meetings need to be carefully planned, and uh, there's no point in Moon Jae-in rushing off to Pyongyang or any place else to see Kim Jong-un. I think the idea of sending an envoy, especially someone with an intelligence and a military background, makes a lot of sense. In the past, Lim Dong-wan used to play this role for the South Korean government. Um, you know, the, the North Koreans often roll out their, their diplomats uh, to speak with the United States, and, and no offense to diplomats, but in North Korea as well as in the United States, it's not the diplomats who really hold the balance of decision-making power. Mm -hmm. They're representing their governments, mm -hmm. but it's the military and the security services, especially in North Korea, mm -hmm. that have important decision-making power. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, my question is, who will be the U.S. envoy? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Ambassador Joe Yoon has uh, retired. Mm -hmm. Uh, who will represent the United States if mm -hmm. talks get going? Mm -hmm. uh, we need someone credible, and I'm not sure who that person is right now. Yes, oh, I, on that point, on that point, it seems that CIA is the main channel now in North Korea and not the State Department. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, the DNI, of course, General Clapper, when he was a DNI, obviously traveled to, uh, uh, to the North. Um, I, I'm not so sure whether it is the CIA, although I think from, as Frank said, from the South Korean perspective, you know, it's been the intelligence to North Korean intelligence service and foreign affairs to State Department for the U.S. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, someone like Pompeo could be the, the, because he's not an Asia specialist, and I worry a little bit that the U.S. CIA director, mm -hmm. uh, while he may represent the Trump administration well, mm -hmm. which is an important uh, mm -hmm. prerequisite for any envoy. I'm not sure that he has the right skill set for this kind of a job. I think that uh, President Trump might want to look outside uh, since Ambassador Yoon has stepped down. You know, maybe this is a, a, a role for maybe a, a retired former general officer. Mm -hmm. You know, as you mentioned, security and the military for the North uh, are most important. Maybe a, uh, a general officer of, uh, you know, with a, a good reputation mm -hmm. might be uh, able to play that role along with a South Korean mm -hmm. uh, uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, North officer. Korea, after having sent a delegation to South Korea, now is fully briefed about the stance of South Korea and the United States. So what will be the next big decision that North Korea has to make, Frank? Well, I think the immediate decision for them is how to respond to the upcoming uh, spring training exercises that will be held uh, with the U.S. and ROK forces. Uh, my hope is that the South Koreans will be able to convince North Korea and that the United States also will convince North Korea that any kind of uh, missile response, nuclear test, will only result in more sanctions and pressure from the UN and that would be very counterproductive. Uh, but that's one decision. I think the next decision they have to make is, is when they try to sit down with the United States, do they try to address the precondition that the United States has established? Are they willing to signal in some way uh, their desire to live on a denuclearized peninsula? Uh, I'm not very optimistic about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's not clear uh, when the U.S. and North Korea could actually manage to sit down. Mm -hmm. David? I think their near-term objective is to have a reduction in sanctions. You know, and I think that's part of the charm offensive, uh, you know, s starting with uh, uh, the New Year's Day speech. Uh, and so I think the North is trying to find some way to do that. I think Frank is exactly right. Another missile test uh, will not have a reduction in, in sanctions. Mm -hmm. However, I think also President Trump, uh, even if we sit down and, and have talks, I think President Trump is going to be reluctant to reduce pressure until the North demonstrates uh, a credible uh, will to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And so if the North is interested in reducing sanctions and if they're having an effect uh, on the regime, uh, then the North is going to have to be the one to make uh, a, a credible statement and demonstration of its will mm -hmm. uh, to change its behavior mm -hmm. and to reduce tensions before the United Nations, before the United States and its unilateral sanctions uh, mm -hmm. are lifted mm -hmm. or, or reduced. David just mentioned about President Trump's position. Um, Frank, how has the United States been responding to South Korea's efforts of match matchmaking between Pyongyang? Well, it's been a little chaotic, to be honest, uh, because on the one hand, uh, you had Vice President Pence and other senior administration officials, including Secretary Tillerson, express a willingness to sit down to talk about talks, to sort of discuss the shape of the table without preconditions. 
Uh, and there was even the hint that uh, Vice President Pence might uh, have proceeded with a meeting with uh, Kim Yo-jong or Kim Yong-nam uh, during the Olympics. But then uh, on, on the next day, you might have a tweet or a statement coming out of the president's uh, uh, office, essentially saying that talks are pointless, dialogue doesn't work, uh, if, if China doesn't fix it, or, uh, the United States will, uh, and, 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 and also referencing the threat of a preventive attack on, on North Korea. So I would like to think this was some carefully orchestrated uh, good cop, bad cop, uh, pressure and engagement strategy. I'm less persuaded that that's what's going on here, frankly. I think there's just a lot of indecision. And, and on, on one day, the administration is, is attacking west, and, and on the next day, it's attacking east. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that makes it very hard for both North Korea and our allies mm -hmm. uh, to, to get a good read mm -hmm. on, on exactly what the United States mm -hmm. wants. However, I, uh, in talking to colleagues, both in the US government and in the Korean government, I've noticed that uh, they all say that there is tremendous coordination taking place uh, between the Blue House and the White House at the, the NSC staff level, uh, between the State Department and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I mean, the, the permissions for, uh, for the, the North Korean delegations to travel who are sanctioned, uh, you know, required coordination with both the UN and the United States. And uh, my South Korean friends uh, said that the cooperation they received uh, in, in coordinating that with the U.S. was quick, was thorough, was professional. I'm optimistic uh, that you know, our long alliance uh, is strong, uh, the foundation uh, is strong, and, uh, and the necessary coordinations uh, can and hopefully are taking place. By Frank, um, Ambassador Zhou Yun is uh, leaving the State Department. How is, would this impact the overall U.S. policy on North Korea? The policy won't change, uh, uh, but there is a saying in Washington that people are policy and policy are people. Uh, the, the implementers do matter, uh, and I think his departure is a blow to the State Department, that, which is already depleted. Um, however, uh, no one is irreplaceable. There, there are plenty of talented foreign service and civil service officers who remain uh, to work this account. Um, it's just the timing of it is unfortunate mm -hmm. because he's, he's going to be hard to replace. Mm -hmm. We'll have to end this conversation here and move on to our next topic. Second, completely stop the joint military exercises, which is key factor that undermines regional peace and security. I have no reason, though, to believe that, they, that we wouldn't uh, restart. We've done those for many decades. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Republic of Korea is our strong, staunch ally. The U.S. and South Korea is expected to go ahead with joint military drills after the Paralympics. This is one of the largest military drills in the world, involving tens of thousands of troops. Now, Frank, um, the joint drills will, is expected to go ahead as planned. Why is this important? Well, from a deterrent standpoint, the United States and South Korea want to signal that they're always ready uh, to the north. I think it's also important uh, as a signal right now to North Korea that although this Olympic peace period uh, hopefully opens up a channel for north-south uh, reduction of tension, uh, that the United States and South Korea are not going to unilaterally uh, disarm. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, you know, military uh, capabilities uh, are, are maintained for a reason, uh, to, to accomplish political objectives. And in this case, we have a, a very important political objective uh, a political military objective, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and peace. Uh, and, and so the, the exercises can and should be calibrated to the political environment. Mm -hmm. David, do you agree that the exercises should follow with the political environment? Well, of course, uh, you know, we, the military has to, uh, it, it exists to achieve political objectives. However, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, that one, training is perishable and readiness uh, and the combined military force, ROC and U.S., is charged by both 
uh, the Korean and U.S. government to be able to defend South Korea. And uh, in particular, it has to give priority to defending Seoul as well. Uh, and as we all know, North Korea has a, a, a huge artillery threat uh, to Seoul. So uh, it must maintain that readiness. And military officers are, are going to advocate for, that we must continue to train. Uh, I think from politically, well, first of all, you know, I participate in every team spirit, full legal, key resolve, ultra freedom guardian, ultra focus lens, all of those exercises. And I, I really have to emphasize that these are defensive in nature. Mm -hmm. Despite the rhetoric that we hear, even within the South and political leaders, these are defensive plans mm -hmm. and they're necessary for the combined forces mm -hmm. to prepare to defend against a North Korean attack. Mm -hmm. Now the timing of these exercises obviously have been postponed because of the Olympics, mm -hmm. but uh, what we see North Korea doing from November until March is executing its winter training cycle mm -hmm. Uh, and bringing its forces to the highest state of readiness to the optimal attack time, which is March, uh, when the ground is still frozen before the, the fields are planted. And so we've always conducted team spirit and our other exercises in this time period to bring Korean and U.S. forces to the highest state of readiness to be able to deter an attack from the north. And, you know, one of the discussions could be confidence building measures, tension reductions, and a reduction in North Korea's military activities uh, because most people focus on the combined rock us military activities and never mention uh, the North's very real threat to the South. And that needs to be emphasized. Mm -hmm. But I, ha I assure you that our exercises are defensive in nature and necessary to uh, maintain readiness of the forces. Mm -hmm. David, you've been with the military for more than three decades. I want your expertise on this. Uh, New York Times reported this week that there have been a tabletop exercises in mm -hmm. Hawaii last week. Yes. Uh, is this a routine exercise or is it an indication that the Trump administration is nearing more towards the war with North Korea? Yeah, first, it is a routine exercise. I mean, the military, all the combatant commanders conduct tabletop exercises year round. So it is not unusual in, it, in itself. Obviously, uh, with the tensions on the peninsula, military commanders want to examine all of uh, the contingencies and the possibilities and the likely actions that North Korea is going to take to threaten the South. And so this tabletop exercise is not an indication that we're moving towards war, but it is what military commanders must do in response to tensions. And of course, President Trump has uh, directed the military to ensure that the military can provide him all the options uh, that uh, are necessary uh, in case North Korea does attack the South. Mm -hmm. Frank, um, let me ask you, uh, should President Moon request further delays to the drills? What will be the best scenario? I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think there's never a, a time that we're going to prepare militarily uh, that the North Koreans are going to uh, approve of. So delaying the, the exercises doesn't make sense to me. I do think, though, that uh, David raised a really interesting point. He's been on the front lines in these exercises, and he knows their defensive character. I think we should make a stronger effort to get the North to an observer status at these military exercises. I think we need to both impress them with our capability, but also something about our intentions, because these military exercises, are, for the most part, uh, are not gaming uh, a South Korean attack, they're gaming a successful defense of the peninsula. I can tell you that any military commander would welcome observers, and we have offered observer status to the North before, and the, having North Korean military officers uh, come and see South Korean and U.S. military exercise would be something that we would welcome very much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll have to wrap it here and move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment, a time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. The photo today is a photo of alleged passports of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and his late father Kim Jong-il. The Reuters reports the leaders used fraudulently obtained Brazilian passports to apply for visas to visit Western countries in the 1990s. Frank, what's your reaction? Wow, well, I mean, um, a bad hair day for Kim Jong-il. <laughs> um, people think sometimes that the North Korean leaders are uh, very isolated. It's a good reminder that they're not quite as isolated as we may think, mm -hmm. and whether it's trips to Disneyland uh, mm -hmm. or, or visits to China, I think the leadership of North Korea gets around occasionally. Mm -hmm. David? Two words, mm -hmm. Brazil nuts, my mm -hmm. wife's favorite food. <laughs> and using a Brazilian passport and Kim Jong-un uh, uh, using that, I think Brazil nuts sums it up for me. 
All right, that's all the time we have for this week. David, Frank, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from The Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. See you next week.